the Vietnamese were a very good army. We, we, we can't, for, we, we shouldn't denigrate them at all. The North Vietnamese beat the French. I just want to say that again. The North Vietnamese beat the French, and the French were backed by the United States. So let's not pretend that North Vietnam didn't have a good army. And let's not pretend that the South, uh, the South Vietnamese, the Viet Cong, weren't a very dedicated, effective fighting force. The Vietnam War was very, very hard. It wasn't a little war. It was a big war. Millions of people died. Millions of people died. So, no, Vietnam was a big, big deal. Um, it wasn't a uh, stand-up conventional fight like we're seeing, but it's, it, the terrain wasn't conducive to that. It was a bloody, bloody battle fought in the mountains, the valleys, the jungles, uh, the fields of, uh, of Vietnam. And the fighting was as intense as anything you're seeing Anywhere, look at the battle of Hue City and see what happens uh, when you have urban conflict. It, it, you know, so Vietnam was a tough battle. Um, Iraq, it's desert warfare. Um, you know, when the United States fought the Iraqi army in 1991, it was the fourth largest army in the world, 400,000 men. You're going to tell me that that's nothing? You're going to tell me that the army that beat Iran in an eight-year war is nothing? No, it was a serious war. Ask the tens of thousands of Iraqis who died. Was the America joking? What we brought to bear in the Gulf War was the world's best army ever in the history of the world. There was never an army better than the one that we deployed in Desert Storm. We had spent two decades perfecting this in the post-Vietnam era. We modernized it. We trained. We prepared to fight the Soviets on the ground in Europe using combined arms tactics with the most sophisticated weaponry in the world. What we brought to Iraq was the world's most lethal killing machine. And then people say, oh, the war was easy because we won. We beat the world's fourth largest army that had just emerged victorious from a war with Iran. They were professional soldiers, the Iraqis. They weren't a joke. We beat them because we were better, not because it was easy. War isn't easy. War is very, very hard. Iraq and Afghanistan, two different things now. Now here we're talking about low-intensity conflict. When we started the conflict with Iraq, yeah, I don't think anybody can say that the Iraqi army that faced us in 2003 was a credible threat. Because from 1991, when we defeated them the first time, until 2003, uh, in that intervening time, they hadn't had a chance to rebuild because of economic sanctions. It was an army that languished, that was cannibalizing itself just to stay up. They didn't have modern weaponry. They didn't have modern communications. They didn't have an air force. They didn't have an air defense. And they were going up against the remnants of the world's greatest military. We were still very good. We just weren't as big as we used to because of we were shrinking. But our military was still the best military in the world. Make no bones about it. The military that went across the line of departure in 2003, no one could beat us. No one could beat us. And so then people say, well, it was easy to beat the Iraqis. It wasn't easy. That was a tough fight. The Iraqis put up a tough fight. But they were fighting the world's best army. They lost. Afghanistan. The Taliban got beat by the world's best army. <laughs> I mean, why do people denigrate this? Do you not understand how good America is? You know, there's a reason... You know, you don't have this kind of policy that we have, a militaristic policy, without being pretty darn good. You don't want to fight us. Even today, you don't want to fight us. Because we will kill you. If we mobilize and get the total power of our nation together, there's nothing that can stop us. Nothing that can stop us. We're killers. You know, the Russians are pretty good. But in the Russian heart, there's a human. In the American heart, there isn't a human. We're killers. Our entire nation's history has been predicated upon killing people. That's what we do, and we do it better than anybody else in the world. So, you know, did we lose in Vietnam? We lost politically. We lost politically. But we slaughtered the Vietnamese. Did we lose in the Middle East? We lost politically. But in every stand-up fight, we won. Nobody beats us. Nobody has ever beat us. Not in a stand-up fight. And nobody will ever beat us in a stand-up fight. Because we are killers. The good news is, politically, we're a mess. 
politically, we're a disaster. We lose our wars politically. We lose our wars because we go to war, uh, you know, war is an extension of politics by other means. Simply killing people doesn't, doesn't accomplish anything. You have to kill people for a purpose. There has to be a purpose to justify the effort so that other people buy into it so you get a conclusion that is satisfactory. But we go to the war for the wrong reasons. And therefore, we can't sustain it. Because even though we have a, a, a military that's very good at killing, we have a nation that's better at consumerism than that. We want to be comfortable. You know, it's sort of a dichotomy. We have this military that's all about killing. We're very good at it. We have a nation that's all about comfort. Well, killing and comfort don't come together. They're two totally separate things. So when the killing starts to become uncomfortable, we stop killing. We quit. We withdraw. Not because we were defeated militarily. No one can beat us. No one can beat us except ourselves. And that's the good news. Because we beat ourselves over and over and over and over again. And thank goodness we do that. Because America, you can't have this power that's running around uh, you know, bullying people. Because that's what we are. We're a global bully. We are really the worst country in the world, the way we act. We have the potential of being the best country in the world. But we're not. How we interface with the world is arrogance, hubris, and death. Why is it the number one ambassador for the United States is a military officer? Why is it when we talk about our relationships with the Middle East, it was Central Command that took the forefront? Our diplomats, the ambassadors, supported Central Command, supported the military effort because we defined our relationship in terms of war-making potential instead of economic prosperity, peace. Co no, no, war, war, war. That's how we define it. Africa. Africa Command is what leads the way. We go in with generals who meet with nations to talk about security. How does China lead? Do they go in with generals or do they go in with businessmen and diplomats and sit down and say, how do we peacefully coexist? How do we get along? How can we make something that's economically beneficial? Now, for a while, the world was buying into the American uh, rhetoric that you know, talked about threat here, a threat here. Everything's a threat. And so they said, well, protect us, protect us. And America came in to protect them. But after decades of being protected by America, people are starting to evaluate and say, well, we aren't safe. We live in a dangerous neighborhood, and the biggest danger in our neighborhood is America. Everything America touched dies. Everything. We don't grow anything. We don't build anything. Look at Georgia, little Georgia. We claim we want democracy for Georgia. We claim we want good things to happen to Georgia. But what we're doing, we're destroying Georgian society for what purpose? To create a second front against Russia. That's war. That's why I keep telling the Georgian people, stop. Stop. Walk away from us. We bring nothing but death. We will destroy your nation. Look at the Ukrainians. What good have we brought there in the pursuit of democracy? Nothing. There's nothing good about what we've done there. Look at Afghanistan. What good did we bring there? Nothing. Look at Iraq, how destructed, destroyed it, how, did, how dysfunctional it is. That's because of us. Nothing good happened there. Look what we tried to do to Syria. Look what we did do to Libya. Everything we touch dies everything. But to sit here and pretend that somehow America can't fight, no, 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 no. We'll kill you. We'll kill you. We'll slaughter you. That's what we do. That's what we're built to do. That's what America's all about. Dwight Eisenhower warned us, don't allow this to happen. Don't let the military industrial complex hijack America. But we have, and now we have a political military industrial complex uh, blob that basically in order to survive has to feed off of conflict. So America exists to create conflict in the world to feed the blob. Ladies and gentlemen, that's it. That's America's relationship with the world in a handbasket. We exist to create conflict. The conflict then feeds, allows the military industrial complex to grow and it empowers Congress with money and power. That's it. We are a cancer to the world. We are a cancer. Now, hopefully the world's starting to wake up. And one way you cure cancer is to cut off the blood supply. Petrodollar is the blood supply. Stop spending dollars. 
walk away from the American economy. Brazil, walk away while you have a chance. Argentina, walk away. South America, walk away. Just walk away, say no. Just say no. You know, back in the 1980s, we had a drug campaign where uh, I think Nancy Reagan, Ronald Reagan's wife, would come on and, you know, just say no to drugs. Well, the petrodollar is a global narcotic. Just say no. Walk away. You'll do yourself such a world of good. You'll be involved with people that don't want to dominate you, don't want to dictate to you, don't want you get to get you involved in war conflict. If our leading export is an F-35 fighter, we got a problem. We got a big problem. Now, that army's dead. That army's gone. That army's buried, crippled, blown up. Um, there's a new army. Um, it, 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 you know, Ukraine right now has a, um, an army that they've reconstructed during combat, during war. It's an army that... Um, is capable of very limited tasks. They can dig holes in the ground, they can go into the ground, and they can die in the ground. That's what they're good at right now. Digging, going in, and dying. They die hard. They fight hard in that hole. But this isn't a maneuver army. You know, it takes a lot to train a maneuver army. Now, there are certain aspects of the Ukrainian army that have been pulled out and sent to, um, to Germany where they've received combined arms training, a couple battalions worth. And they're going to be equipped with this new European equipment, you know, the Leopard tank, the Challenger tank, uh, the Martyr infantry fighting vehicle, the Bradley infantry fighting vehicle, maybe even the Abrams tanks down the road. They, they get these. So they come together. They're, they're going to have this little group here. Um, but this is a new entity. Uh, it's not big enough, it's not powerful enough, it's not trained enough to have any meaningful impact on the battlefield. All they'll do is die. That's literally all they're going to do. They don't have the artillery to back up this offensive. They're running out of ammunition. There's not enough ammunition. There's not going to be enough ammunition. The uh, Ukrainian counteroffensive is, um, you know, it, we should hope that it's fiction. Because if it's fiction, then it won't happen and people won't get slaughtered. But what I do think is there's some reality to it. They have two to three brigades worth of new forces that are being mobilized with Western equipment and these trained troops, and they think that they can do something against the Russians. But the fact that you and I are talking about it means that the Russian general staff has been talking about it too, and they're not stupid. You know, the bulk of the 300,000 troops that were mobilized have not been committed to the front yet. There's still entire divisions worth that are getting their final training. Uh, that's divisions versus brigades. When you attack, you on a three-to-one advantage. The Ukrainians will be attacking about a one-to-six disadvantage. You really think this is going to succeed? It's fantasy. And it's tragedy because everybody that's in those attacking forces will die. All of their equipment will be destroyed. Will they kill a couple of Russians? Yeah. But they're not going to win. There's not going to be a Ukrainian counteroffensive worthy of the name. There'll be a brief period of time where the Ukrainians make a lot of noise and then they all die and they go back to doing what they're doing right now is digging holes, going in the ground, getting killed in the ground. Well, the U.S. doesn't know, to be honest. I mean, they know what they want. They want a Russian defeat, but that's not going to happen. What they don't want is a Russian victory, and that is going to happen. But they haven't come to grips with that. You see, if we were a mature nation, we'd say, well, Russia won. How do we mitigate that da damage? How do we, okay, we've lost. How can we preserve as much as Ukraine as necessary, pull back, keep NATO intact, and then consolidate down the road, build for the future? That requires maturity. That requires a leader that's able to look people in the face and say, yeah, we got beat. Um, you know, we, we tried to do something, didn't happen. We got beat. We got to accept this. Uh, we're going to make a peace right now. And uh, we're going to pull back and we're going to see what's, you know, in the future, we'll, we'll, we'll take a look at what we're going to do. That's called honesty. That's called integrity. But instead, we pretend that we can win. We reject the ceasefire because to do so would allow Russia to, you know, legitimize its gains. So we're acknowledging that Russia's winning <laughs> by that. You know, it's not like we're saying, you know, we don't want it because Ukraine's winning. What we're saying is we do it now, Russia wins. It's a victory for Russia, um, which means it's a defeat for NATO. So we're trying to hold out on some sort of hope that something happens, but we don't. We know that nothing's going to happen. 
they just did a million round contribution where, you know, I mean, have you ever seen the Jerry Lewis telethon? It was an old thing back in the day uh, for muscular dystrophy. We used to watch it every uh, Labor Day. And, um, you know, people call in with their pledges. You know, Jerry Lewis would sing a song, bring out an act, and people would call in, and you, and you see the number on the back growing, all the money that they're getting. But that's fake money because it's just a pledge. It's just me calling up saying, I pledge $100. Bing, it grows by 100 But until I give them $100, it's fake money. The money's still with me. They don't have it. So Europe's coming together going, we pledge a million artillery rounds. Bing, everybody's going, a million artillery rounds. They don't exist. Most of them have been produced because in order to get there, you have to build a production line. You have to fund the production line. The production line has to start producing the ammunition, which means it's not going to be ready for a year, a year and a half. There's a smaller amount of ammunition. They're going to go around. They're going to, it's like me pledging 100 bucks and going into my couch, lifting up the cushions and picking up a couple pennies and go, well, I got $7.23 here. Here, take that. Uh, but I have to go and, uh, and get a job and, and wait for my paycheck to come in to get you the rest. That's what the million rounds is. It's fiction. It's fantasy. They'll put a couple rounds up front, but Ukraine is chewing through their ammunition right now. Why hasn't Bakhmut fallen? Bakhmut hasn't fallen because Ukraine is pouring artillery into the battle, slowing down the Russian advance. Not defeating the Russians, but slowing it down. And all that artillery they're using in Bakhmut, that ammunition is supposed to be preserved for their counteroffensive. Because if those three brigades that they're building are going to have any chance of doing anything, they're going to need massive quantities of artillery to suppress and break up Russian defenses, to break up Russian counterattacks before they happen, to suppress Russian artillery fire so these forces can advance. But if you go into battle and you don't have the ammunition, the Russian artillery is going to slaughter you before you even get to the forward line of defenses. And once you get into forward line of defenses, they're going to counterattack because you can't stop the counterattack. This is basic war stuff, man. This is, you know, this is War 101. Ukraine can't do this. They don't have any ammunition. We know it. We're faking it. We're making stuff up. What? I don't understand it. Why is Joe Biden's administration unable to accept the reality of what's happened? Why do we have to lie, lie, lie all the way up to the very end, especially when these lies result in the deaths of tens of thousands and eventually hundreds of thousands of additional Ukrainians? You know, in the old days, when you would lose like this, the honorable thing was, to kill yourself. So if the Biden administration has any honor, uh, perhaps we'll see mass suicide amongst the Biden administration. People just go out and do the honorable thing. Hang yourself, blow your brains out, do something. The other thing that would happen is that you would be held accountable by an international tribunal, like the Nuremberg Tribunal. And if that would happen, then we would see the majority of the Biden administration found guilty, and their necks would be placed in nooses, and they would be hung by the neck until dead, because they are criminal. What we're talking about here is criminal activity. This is stuff that's a crime against humanity. It's a crime against the Ukrainian people. It's a crime against the Russian people. It's a crime against the world. But that's not the world we live in. The Biden administration, of course, will continue because it's part of an American establishment. And even when Biden gets voted out, we'll replace them with somebody who's just like Biden because they reflect the same warmongering principles that the United States has adopted as it's what that which defines who it is and what it is today.